Hello, my name is Wolfgang Karstens, and welcome to Poets Underground, a poetry show that celebrates and showcases the best and the brightest authors currently working, the marrow of contemporary poetry. My guest tonight, joining us live by a satellite from Wisconsin, is the angel of death, Mr. John Dorsey. Mr. Dorsey is the author of over 45 books and chapbooks, most notably Harvey Keitel, Harvey Keitel, Harvey Keitel, Sodomy is a City in New Jersey, Tombstone Factory, and most recently, Appalachian Frankenstein. John, it's been a long time coming, my friend. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to Poets Underground. How are you doing tonight, my friend? Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing better than I have been doing in weeks. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, man. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And really, to be talking to anyone, if I'm honest. I've been, the last couple months, I've been literally kind of underground, kind of hibernating. So it's, it's good to be here. You know, I, I want to jump right in here. So I introduced you as the Angel of Death, which obviously, of course, you're not. Um, but, you know, looking back over to your considerable body of work, um, a large portion of it is written about, is poetry written about people who've passed away. Um, so I was wondering, in, as far as the mandate for your work, is it important to chronicle the lives of these people to, whether it's to honor them or uh, bear testament to certain uh, people? I mean, I I think I, I, I'm doing it to honor them. Um, I do think it's important. Um, because, you know, as an, as an example, like of someone you've published, like someone like Todd Moore, who passed away five, over five years ago now, I feel like a lot of younger poets and a lot of poets say on Facebook right now don't even know who Todd is because the poetry community tends to go in waves. And every few years you have completely different people. And unless you remind them who came before and they just don't know. So yeah, I, I do think it's important. Right. And you know, that's interesting too, because I think I've discovered some of my favorite authors by whether you get hooked on a Jim Morrison next day, you're reading Arthur Rimbaud and Charles Baudelaire and Friedrich Nietzsche, and then you read them and then you go from there. So yeah, I, I understand that completely, my friend. Yeah, it's, um, for me, I've been very blessed in that I've met a, a lot of really great people that I'd like to honor. My friend Mike West likes to say that I like to adopt old people, um, and, and there's probably some truth to that. A lot of my friends have been older, so a lot of my friends have passed away. So, you know, it's uh, it's interesting you bring that up too because I was going to ask you about that. Um, you know, uh, the ACDC song "It's a Long Way to the Top" if you want to rock and roll. Uh, you, for me, kind of embody that song. I mean, no doubt you've been uh, ripped off, broken bone. Um, you, you lead this vagabond existence, you know, you you live in an art center, you travel around the world on buses to do tours and readings, and, um, you know, along the way, you've, you've sacrificed quite a bit. I mean, whether it's marriage, stability, um, you know, career, finances. And in, the flip side, of course, is that you have also enabled yourself to meet some of the most influential and important poets of our generation. I mean, you've, you've been able to talk to them and, and read with them and party with them and, and share a meal with them. So I was going to ask you, you know, um, since you bring this up, how important is, is this vagabond existence to the, the essence of John Dorsey? Um, you know, it's probably everything. I, you know, for me, I don't think that it is like a bag of all existence so much as just my life. But yeah, I, I mean, you do give up certain things. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not married. My finances are never quite straight. Um, but I'm okay with that. And I don't think that I would have met people I've met had my life been uh, more ordinary. And, and that, that's okay. I mean, I think, I think there are a lot of people that would like to have the opportunities I've had, so I, I feel blessed in a, in a strange way. Right. Uh, do, do you think it's um, something that has contributed to who you are and the kind of work that you produce, being able to meet and... Because, and, I mean, let's face it, you're not... You're talking poetry with some of the greats. You're talking craft with some of the greats. You're, 
you're watching some of the greats read and you're you're getting the benefit of all their experience in the process. Oh, oh, sure. And it's, it's like you said, like when I meet people, I, I tend to write, I tend to write about them, whether they're living, dead, they become part of part of my story, like what I write about. So, yeah, I, I do benefit from that. And I do take inspiration from their work, like the things they've done in their lives. And I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm very, very, very fortunate. I mean, some people would look at my life and say that it's a mess, but I, I think that I'm very lucky. And maybe I'm just crazy, but that's how I feel. Right. You know, um, I think I, I've, I described your, you personally as a man who was born with crystal balls for eyes. Um, and what I meant by that is, you know, I find it in your work. It's it's coming at you from all angles. It's it seems that what seems at first to be a series of random images and feelings and expressions, and you never quite know where it's going. And then it all comes together at the end and gelatinizes to produce this unified whole, and you get that aha moment at the end. And and as a reader, you're left to just sit back and, and marvel at the genius of a John Dorsey poem. Um, I wanted to ask you, how, how much does stream of consciousness play in your writing? Um, that, that's a really good question, because I think, you know, while I might set out with a theme, or like, I, I keep a memory book, like, which is basically like I write down, I write down certain things that have happened to me that I feel like might make a good poem. But in between that, I think there's a lot of stream of consciousness, and you know what? I think that I just I, I think the close the way you close a poem is the most important part. So I've always been looking out for that. You know, um, I, I read that you don't revise your work. Um. Yeah. I, I I'm a, not often. I tend to revise when I'm writing the poem. Like, but once but once I hand someone the poem and I say it's done, then the poem is done. Like. If, if it appears in a magazine or if I hand it to a friend and I tell them this is the poem, then I don't touch it because, I, you know, the thing is, I, if I went back and did that and I have done stuff like that in the past, I tend to overthink it and then I fuck it up. And, you know, I, I'm just not, I don't want to overwrite. Right. And so, you know, I just usually when... I'll know. I'll know when it's when it's done, I, and I don't go back. I, I'm not. I, I you know if I'm in a workshop and someone's like, "Well, you should revise it and do this." I tend to not do it because I feel I, I just feel like it's done. Right. Right. I gotcha. Um, you know, let me ask you this. And I ask all my guests this: Is there an, uh, like a, a seminal John Dorsey poem, like a poem that you've written that kind of encapsulates your work and what it's all about? And if there is, do you know it, and, and will you read it for us? Um, yeah, I think the poem that probably most encapsulates, like, my work, and more, like, encapsulates me, like, who I am, which is basically what my work is, it's just me. So it's a poem I wrote called The Year Joe Brainerd Died, which is in Sodomy City, New Jersey, but it's, you know, the closest I've ever gotten to writing an autobiography and it kind of gives you an idea of who I am and who my poems are. But I'll, I'll go ahead and read that. Absolutely. The year Joe Brainerd died. The year Joe Brainerd died. The year Joe Brainerd died, I was in high school. The papers didn't mention anything. It was the year of Charles Bukowski, Kurt Cobain, and the Teatro Cafe. All of the kids I knew were busy wearing a heart-shaped box on their sleeve. I carried a trapper keeper with kittens on it. My poems tucked inside. Sitting in the local mall, my friend Mike Mason shaking as he read one aloud. Smoking countless wishes weed cigars with conviction. I don't remember the conversation. Only that Mike drove a beat to shit 73 Nova, and that he spent $60 on egg rolls in two days. Because he had a crush on a girl that worked in the food court who would later take out a restraining order. Those were the days pre-trench coat mafia. 
Before Bill Clinton forgot to take that dress to the dry cleaners, I did inhale. So Nirvana and tingles just blocks away in 1991. Kids today don't smoke like they mean it. I remember that Mike had a nervous condition, had been through the ninth grade three times and was working on a fourth. I remember we ran into this kid I knew from elementary school who looked exactly like Lee Majors. I remember that was the year JP and I watched the Stones for the first time from nosebleed seats at, th at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, trading a poorly rolled joint for a couple of beers. I remember later that night sitting on the curb talking to strippers from the Good and Plenty Bar while we waited for my aunt to pick us up. Hey, Joe, I think of you now, and I remember many things. I remember using a well-known Atlantic City sweatshirt as a pillow on hot summer nights in South Philly. I remember making out with Lauren Snow in a treehouse in Penn Hills at the age of nine. Around the same time, my grandmother died. I remember Gregory getting me a prostitute for the first time. I remember Randall Tex Cobb passed out drunk on a center city sidewalk at noon. I remember running into him weeks later, and then he stuck everyone to see Spider-Man down by the docks. I still have the popcorn box he signed. But I haven't talked to Tyrone in years. <clears throat> I remember the poncho Brenda brought back from Bolivia. I still have it. She has two children now. I remember drinking for the first time. Airline bottles of vodka on a swing set age 11. I didn't stop flying for years. I remember thoughts of suicide at 10. Having to wear a plastic leg brace everywhere I went. And how having cerebral palsy meant I wasn't normal. I remember nights that are still going on somewhere. Drunk with Fred at the Cheap Art Cafe. It's gone now. I remember Christina's smell. How it stayed on my sheets for months after she was gone. I remember my first lie. I wish it had been my last. I remember holding hands with Caroline while sitting on a bench by the Jewish cemetery in Rossford, Ohio. I remember that I haven't been in love since Jessica left. I remember that every day, whether I want to or not. Thanks for the memories, Joe. I think of you often lately. Can't say I remember you, but from what I've heard, you were the stuff ghosts write love songs about. So tonight when I go to sleep, I will try to remember the last words you sang in your dreams. Wow. Awesome, man. Thanks, man. Fantastic. You know, um, now, you know, on Poets Underground, uh, we love poetry. We love lots of poetry. Um, I got one, one last question for, for you to launch into your set. Um, as a reader, you're, you're in, in high demand. You're always in high demand. Um, and, and the reading you just gave is, is a great example why. I wanted to ask you, how important is it, um, in your opinion, for poets to get out there and to read their work in public um, on a regular basis? Um, I think it's very important, but I, I think the readings are, uh, they're kind of secondary. The, the, really, the real important thing is the travel and the friendships that come about um, from doing all that. I, I think that's what really gets your work out there, meeting people. And readings are just kind of an excuse to meet people. But I think, uh, you know, you can touch people in a different way of reading a poem as opposed to them reading it on a page. And I think you want to give them as many options on how to get into your work as possible. So I, I think it's highly important. I, my whole life would be completely different if I hadn't gone out on the road. I mean, I think I did probably a thousand reading between 2004 and 2014 before I, I got really sick here. But uh, yeah, I, I'm itching to get back out on the road and I would urge everyone to do it. I think it's, I think it's critical. Right. Fair enough. Great answer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. John Dorsey, uh, you have 15 minutes, brother. So uh, go ahead and lay down some bombs, my friend. Okay.
All right. Um, this this is a poem written early this year. It's uh, called After Rodney's After Rodney's brother Robbie. After Rodney's brother Robbie had a heart attack at 28. Their mother set him up on the sofa in the living room and asked us to keep an eye on him while she worked a double as a nurse in the local old folks home. Even though he rarely moved, we guided him like toy soldiers at a Civil War reenactment. He was the fallen, telling us stories about Lawrence of Arabia, Julius Caesar, and Robert E. Lee in battles he never lifted a finger in, sending us off into imaginary foxholes, into foreign lands, located between him and the icebox, in search of ham sandwiches. When he died a few months later, I remembered how he said that silence is a song only the dead can sing. How he carried that tune with a heavy heart, for all those who would come before him, and how it was his story that was left untold. Nice. Okay, um, this, is a, this is another one from the same group of poems. These were a group of poems that were about a childhood friend of mine, and this is a poem called Rodney's Sister. Rodney's sister used to stay up nights, stealing our toy fighter planes, soaring with eagles, while holding a flickering flashlight under her My Little Pony blanket. Long after the sun went down, she spent years in the Air Force, dreaming of the strong women she never knew, only to come back from Italy with two black eyes and an, al and an alcoholic husband who used his tongue like enemy fire, batting her around the room, laughing as she curled up next to the bedroom window, like a cat hiding in the belly of a ball turret. After she got pregnant, he threw her down the stairs as part of a training exercise. He said he just wanted to see if she was prepared for the crash landing. Okay, switch it up a little bit here. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, and this poem you know well. This was the first poem from Tombstone Factory, but I want to reread it for people. And this is uh, The Bride of Frankenstein. The Bride of Frankenstein. My eighth grade shop teacher once sewed off three fingers in the same week, often sending us in search of his missing digits, promising extra credit to, to the lucky student who helped him sew them back on in the nurse's office. We were Frankenstein. He was a misunderstood monster with weak hands and bolts for brains. It was a few weeks before we noticed her pot belly, the new girl. She had transferred in mid-semester, rumor had it, to escape an abusive father. He in his mid-forties, it seemed strange to see them holding hands behind his weathered workbench. But what did we know? Their romance was a silent movie. Though if there had been any protests, they would have been hard to hear over the noise on the shop floor. As time went by, we noticed her stomach expanding teaching us more at 14 than any health class ever could. One afternoon, the principal came in and asked us to wait out in the hall. He had us line up against the wall and walk quickly back inside. She was crying, an ugly princess in a flaming tower made of balsa wood that would never hold up against the weight of her own decisions. We took turns running up to the shop window, steaming glass. When it was my turn, all I could see were the girl's parents screaming in slow motion, and now they know it's pregnant and slut. A few days later, a new teacher walked in and inspected our work. We said nothing. 
We found out over the summer that they had, had twins. Getting married in a quick shotgun service so he could avoid jail time. Later moving in with his aging mother. She became the bride of Frankenstein. In a gown draped with faded pearls, she could never feel pure. Her fingers, his fingers touched her lips, but were too misshapen to ever wear a ring. That a love like a lopsided birdhouse never seemed to match up quite right. As years went by, people talked. We, the villagers, watching quietly as her future became invisible. Words hung like burning pitchforks on the tongue of God. More sad than angry that her dreams had not been sown on stronger hands. Um, this, is, uh, this is a poem you know as well. Um, it's, it's called A Better Year. I am vaguely depressed that an asteroid isn't going to slam into the Earth in 2040. This news resolves nothing. Now I must make plans. I am wrinkled fox and wish on shooting stars. Though well, maybe by then Pluto will be a planet again. New Jersey will smell like roses. And paper airplanes will burn an effigy across our imaginary war zones. For now, we must be happy with killing each other. They tell me it's a party. We're all invited. So be sure to come dressed as your favorite tombstone. Nice. Okay, um, let's see. kind of knew what I wanted to do. And, oh, yeah, I, I only have 15 minutes, so I only want to read uh, two more poems. They're long poems, so that's why I'm only going to do those. Um, and when I, when I was a kid, um, I remember hearing about the death of Adam Walsh, who was the son of John Walsh, who was the host of America's Most Wanted. But Adam Walsh, as you probably know, was murdered um, at the age of seven in Hollywood, Florida. He was abducted and murdered. And since I grew up around the same time he did, and I was a boy his age, I always felt connected to him. So I wrote him a poem. Um, and I actually sent it to John Walsh, who thanked me for it profusely. But uh, this is a poem called The Way Things Were in 1981. In 1981, I had a peach dragon sleeping bag that resembled the Alamo. Back then, I threw kisses at the wind as a form of prayer. Sometimes I wish I could go back there with a flashlight. Five years old, I'd take a bus to Hollywood, Florida. Adam Walsh and I would go roller skating through the aisles of heaven. And I would ask him, what do you want to be when you grow up? Whatever he chose, I would be proud of him. And I would remind him not to talk to strangers. I would say that I was from the future. And when I looked into his eyes, all I could see was a ghost clutching a rosary. Back then, I remember thinking that the local newscaster was the president. He always looked so serious. That was the year my mother took me to the movies for the first time. And my dad bought me a comic book in Niagara Falls on a family vacation. I didn't tell them that you were the reason that I feared going into department stores. And that I once saw an angel on the side of the Walmart ringing a Salvation Army bell that looked a lot like you. And that I was always afraid that they'd steal the stars out of the sky with a butterfly net. Because I always wanted to name one after you. It always felt like we were brothers. Only you were an invisible celebrity and I was a nameless boy. I bet your mother still cries some nights, howling in the wind, where I left those boyhood kisses. I hope they comfort you now. In 1981, I believed that seeing was believing. But now the most powerful things in the world seem to be invisible. And now, as I listen by my window, garbage trucks rumble like the shadows of invisible gods. Their music offering blessings to both the quick and the dead. Wow. 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 All right. Um... And, and, you know, man, I do write a lot about death. <laughs> but, uh, I know 
how you almost feel like you need to do a cleansing after you read, you know? <laughs> um, let's see here. I'm just going to find this one last poem. Okay, um, and this is the poem that when I read anywhere, I tend to close with this poem now. It's changed over the years, but this is the one the last few years. Um, I used to live in Philadelphia, and when I lived there, I had a really close friend who owned a fried chicken restaurant who wound up uh, taking his own life. It was a suicide by cop. He was shot dead by the Philadelphia police trying to burn down his business. And uh, this is a poem called Sam Ryan is a Noodle Heaven. Sam Ryan is a noodle heaven, a cat asleep in the sun. We worshipped your bloom, sang heaven's back alley blues, drank from the mouth of a hurricane, called Nirvana collect without speaking. Someone said, imagine Sam Ryan in noodle heaven. I don't want to. You were shot dead for cursing daylight, father already gone, sister sick with memory. Cancer not far behind. On the corner of Pine Street, leaves of ass scatter like roaches in sunlight. Playing chicken with madness. Sam Ryan is in New Heaven. That plucky Irish kid from the neighborhood who used to talk to comets, who said they used to listen. You who contemplated love with great sadness, called death a toothache, and God's ten nipple a testament to medical ethics. You who drank to become invisible, but left an outline in the flames, said you could have fucked that girl right out of your hair if only we were in the South Pacific. You who proposed marriage to anyone who would listen, while Welsh girls from New Jersey on street corners in heaven, a lonely prize fighter who sang lullabies in love recessions. Sam Ryan is in noodle heaven. Sam Ryan is in noodle heaven. Sam Ryan is in noodle heaven. You who saw the last ice age of Detroit, front row from a Philly sidewalk, who fed your soul with magic, called heaven a black cat, and love the ladder to hell. You who said we are all archaeologists, rebuilding cities from the chaplets of modern myth, that a sunflower turned inward resembles a bone, that bipolar ice caps spell disaster in any font. When your time came, you went out, guns blazing, in a police standoff. Traffic stood still. Trees handed out oxygen, but the dead held their breath for you, as if you were a higher class of animal. Today, I remember how every Thanksgiving you smiled, when Al aces of her figure eights as it snowed outside your window. Today, a little girl asks her mother, who will make her smile now that you are gone? Now let Irish eyes watch over you and cry out, Oh, Sammy boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. And all she can think to say is, Sam Ryan is a noodle heaven. Sam Ryan is a noodle heaven. Sam Ryan is a noodle heaven. From Glen to Glen, a river of blood flows through the cracks of city sidewalks. Your stoop filled in with shadows of lament. But we remember what you lived for, what you died for, and what you dreamed for. Like forgotten flowers, we remember love in your name. Wow. Excellent, Mr. Dorsey. Man, you read like a, like a fucking uh, Gatling gun, my friend. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's, uh, I, you know, I, I tend to be able to peel through poems a lot faster than most people. I kind of learned that from Todd a little bit, but his, his voice was just more mild than mine. I, I kind of had an angrier tone. As you know, his voice was really soft, right. but in terms of rhythm, in terms of speed, he taught me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was talking about, being able to meet these great people and, and learn from them, right? Like, that's amazing, my friend. I love it. You know, when you read, it's almost as if it's like your last fucking performance, man. It's like the, the last hurrah, you know, like you're fucking walking the green mile and this is it, man. This is John Dorsey right here, right now. I'm going to fucking lay it all out on the line. I, you know, you, you never know, man. You never know when it could be your last reading. I, I do kind of read like that. Like it could be my last reading. I, uh, 
I did a reading about a year ago with my friend Sean Thomas Doherty in Cleveland, and man, I, I, I just read it like a motherfucker. Like, I hadn't read that well in a long time. <laughs> and I feel like part of that was reading with Sean, like, wanting to read well because he was there, but uh, also part of it is, like, I've been sick a lot, and you, and you just don't know. So, you know, right. you go out and do the best you can every time. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been Poets Underground, The Angel of Death, Mr. John Dorsey. Uh, you can pick up his books, his newest is Appalachian Frankenstein. You can grab that from John, uh, message him through Facebook, look through the publisher, and the publisher is? Uh, GTK Press. There you are. Thank you for joining us, my friends, and we'll see you again on Poets Underground. John, a pleasure, my friend. Well, that's a pleasure. Have a great time. Absolutely.